Zach. Hi, Mr. Blomberg. How are you? Good. How are you? I'm good. Thank you for giving me some of your time. You're most welcome. How was your time away? It was good. It was a very good experience, and I'm ready to be home, though, now. I like my okay. home. <laughs> Uh, Pennsylvania. I live in Pennsylvania. Which which part? State College, like kind of like near Penn State University. Oh, okay. Yeah. I have a daughter who's at uh, the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's really cool. Mm. Okay. Well, so. Tell me what you got. <laughs> okay, so I have a couple like general questions, kind of about like you and how you got into uh, the field that you did. And then I have some questions about the Gospels and things of, of that nature. Okay, so the first thing I want to know is, how did you become interested in studying the Bible, especially like the New Testament and the Gospels? Yeah. Um, it's not what I thought I wanted to do. I came from a family of, of teachers, and so I often thought I might want to teach, but math was my favorite subject in school, so I set out to be a high school math teacher. But uh, in college, I discovered the uh, academic uh, approach um, or one academic approach to uh, biblical studies that sometimes was quite liberal or skeptical in mm -hmm. university departments. Uh, and so I uh, began to think, um, I think I'd like to try to give some answers, some responses to all of this. And that eventually set me down this track. Okay. That's really awesome. So, would you say that you've always been a Christian, or after studying the New Testament, you kind of realized, oh, this is the truth? Like, where do you, in your faith? Um, C, neither of the above. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was raised in a church, but I would say that it was when I was a sophomore in high school, thanks to a Campus Life Club uh, that my best friend invited me to, that I really saw Christianity as something real among my peers, not just uh, my parents' religion. So mm -hmm. I would say it was when I was 15 that I really trusted Christ and, and made that my own, um, but had no idea I'd be uh, going down the road into what I've done since. Okay. Okay, thank you. Very, thank you. So now I just have a question, couple questions. So starting historically, is there historical evidence for the existence of Jesus? Like, do you, would you believe that's a very historically confirmed fact? Yeah, absolutely. Um, what what evidence do you think there is to support that? Um, even if you uh, rule out all Christian evidence whatsoever, <laughs> there are a dozen different Jewish, Greek, and Roman authors and sources from the earliest centuries that uh, talk about Jesus, and you can get uh, the broad contours of his life and death and at least belief in his resurrection, uh, belief that he was uh, the divine Messiah. Um, but then I don't think it is uh, legitimate to just uh, throw out all Christian sources, nobody would uh, say that uh, you can't uh, cite Islamic sources for the existence of Muhammad. Mm -hmm. uh, if you didn't, you'd uh, have almost no information. Um, the question is, uh, are they reliable sources? And once you allow for Christian sources, you not only have the books of the New Testament, but from earliest days onward, writings uh, of all kinds of other Christians who attest to his existence as well. Okay, thank you. Um, so would you say that Jesus passes the same historical test that figures like Plato, Alexander the Great, Hannibal, like he passes the same test that they would? I would, I would say in many cases uh, he passes the test better. Okay, okay, thank you. So now I just want to talk a little bit about this historic, sorry, I can't say histor historicity of the Gospels. Um, so how is it determined what would be in the New Testament canon? Like how were Matthew, Lu Mark, Luke, and John decided to be part of the scriptures, but like, like the Gospel of Thomas, how that was excluded? What, how was it determined what was in right. the canon? You can find references already within the New Testament to what seems to be... Uh, 
an emerging scripture. Um, Peter, at the end of Second Peter, talks about uh, some of Paul's letters being hard to understand and uh, certain people twisting them as they do the other scriptures. Mm -hmm. So apparently, uh, even by that time, people were recognizing some of what we call the New Testament to be uh, equivalent to the Jewish scriptures, which we call the Old Testament. As you move into the second century, you get uh, quotations and allusions to most of the books of the New Testament in writers we call the Church Fathers, who are otherwise completely orthodox. Mm -hmm. um, and then you do start to get the appearance of the, the Gnostic Gospels, like the Gospel of Thomas. Um, but we're talking uh, probably a hundred years later, or almost, uh, from the other writings. And as church leaders and councils continued to discuss the issue all the way up through the 300s, um, there were three main cr criteria that were used. Um, can you trace a book to an apostle or a close associate of an apostle? Um, is the book consistent with previously revealed scripture? Um, and was it something that was widely acknowledged around the Christian world, which was by this time throughout the Roman Empire and beyond, uh, as opposed to something that was just the product of one small sect or slightly unorthodox branch of Christianity. Um, and you really don't get much uh, debate. You get a few books. Uh, from those so-called church fathers uh, that were suggested, that were probably second century writings. Um, but you don't get uh, people supporting the Gospel of Thomas. You don't get people supporting the Gnostic texts. Um, that's primarily a, a modern idea that people have been doing in the last 75 years or so. Okay, thank you. Um, so when would you, would you say like the main four Gospels or the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, when would you say they were written by? Um, by the end of the first century, at the very latest, mm -hmm. um, you can debate the, the specifics, and conservative scholars will, will often put Matthew, Mark, and Luke all to the 60s, mm -hmm. and then John somewhere into the 80s or 90s. Um, more liberal scholars will sometimes, uh, I suppose, the most common dates would be Mark in the 70s, Matthew and Luke in the 80s, and John in the 90s. But you're still talking about first century, and uh, you're talking about two generations from the death of Jesus in A.D. 30, which by ancient standards is a, a very short period of time. Okay. Um, how do we know that the Gospels are transmitted reliably because you look at you, some people some skeptics would claim that you look at the variants like with the story of the resurrection of Jesus how it's just like there's these variants in the gospels how would we would this make would that make their transmission unreliable yeah. um well you have to, to look at each of those cases that people bring up and decide for yourself are are these actual contradictions or does each account just give part of the information and, and they can all be fit together. Um, what is striking is how often, especially Matthew, Mark, and Luke, do report the same episodes and often in very similar language, uh, suggesting even in places that somebody knew another gospel in written form and chose mm -hmm. to follow that identical wording, but then add something or abbreviate something. Um, but you also have to take into account that the ancient cultures were oral cultures. They weren't print-based. And so things were passed along by word of mouth. Uh, family histories, uh, the epic narratives of a local village, uh, sacred literature, and people who had the opportunity to go to school um, 
we would have been bored stiff if we had to do it their way because it was all rote memorization. There's a, a Jewish tradition that the kids couldn't talk about a passage in the Old Testament until they had it memorized, wow. every one of them, and could publicly recite it without a single mistake. Wow. Then you could talk about it. <laughs> um, and, and there are times when I think, wouldn't it be nice to do that again? You wouldn't have so much misrepresentation. <laughs> that would never happen. Um, so just because a lot of people couldn't read and write doesn't mean they were dumb. It just means they had a, a different form of education. And there are accurate accounts in other ancient works of people having enormous amounts of stuff committed to memory. Um, I was in Israel several years ago. I had the privilege of being there three times, but the last time uh, met a, a Orthodox Jewish rabbi who has the mm. Old Testament memorized. Wow. It blows me away. Wow. Um, but there are a lot of things he hasn't done in life. He didn't play sports, and he doesn't know anything about pop music, and uh, <laughs> I'm quite sure he doesn't surf the web, but uh, <laughs> this, this is what uh, he grew up doing. So when you're in that kind of culture, it's it's very possible and even natural to carefully preserve things. Okay, thank you. So you talk about how Matthew, Mark, and Luke are very, like they fit together. They can really, right. so why is John different? And does that discredit John from being an original source? No, um, he's different because he didn't uh, choose to copy parts of and supplement Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Um, he wrote, as almost everybody agrees, somewhat later and separate from the other three and supplemented and added material that he thought was important to preserve and also wrote things up in his own style of writing. This is a, a world without quotation marks. Nobody's invented them. Nobody feels any need for them. It's completely appropriate to put somebody else's words in your own style, as long as you're faithful to, to what they're teaching. Um, and uh, he was writing to a different group of churches in another part of the empire with, that had different needs, different issues, different debates. Um, but the actual contents, the kinds of things Jesus says and does, uh, if you start looking carefully, you can find something in Matthew, Mark, or Luke that's similar to almost everything in John. Okay, okay. thank you. Um, so a question I have is with the manuscript. So we, there, I believe the earliest manuscript we have is P52, which is, which is of John, which is dated to, I believe, like the early second century. So right. if, the, if the Gospels are written in the first century, why don't we have manuscripts from the first century? Well, once a manuscript wore out uh, and you copied it, there wasn't any reason to keep the original. Um, if you have a, a cheap paperback book that uh, you use enough that eventually it falls apart um, and uh, you want another hard copy, you, you don't keep what you had. Mm -hmm. uh, if it's bad enough, you throw it out. If it's not that bad, you put it in a garage sale. Um, and so uh, it is, it's remarkable that we have as many second century manuscripts as okay. we have, nearly a hundred by the time you get to the end of the second century. Um, any one of which could very easily have been a copy of what one of the writers first wrote. Okay. That's, all right, thank you. Um, so another more skeptical belief is that the apostles believed that the end times were in their lifetime. Sometimes when I read through the Gospels, I've yep. kind of got that same perception. Yep. So did they believe that? And if they did, wouldn't that discredit the Gospels? Or Jesus, at least. Why? Because if the Bible is supposed to be the living word of God, and the apostles believe that the end times were in their lifetimes, wouldn't that make the Gospels wrong? Oh, you mean if that's what they actually taught? Yeah, if that was. Of the New Testament. Yes. Yeah, I, I don't have any difficulty saying that there were Christians early on who heard Jesus talk 
about coming back soon and thought, yeah, that could be in my lifetime. Um, but I don't think there are any passages in the New Testament that are so specific that you have to say the only way you can take this is that uh, they thought Jesus was coming back in the first century, and mm -hmm. therefore they were wrong. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. So, so were doctrines in the church kind of like the suffering Messiah, divinity of Jesus, the Trinity, were they invented later? I've heard that's a claim from a skeptic, like I believe his name is Bart F. Everman, if I believe, yes, I believe that he believes that they were invented later. Is there any evidence for this, or did the gospel support the being in the original text? Yeah, well, um, part of it depends on, on how you define your terms. Uh, the doctrine of the Trinity, okay. No, the word Trinity doesn't appear in the New Testament. Mm -hmm. um, no, if you want to find the language of the apostles or Nicene Creed that some churches still recite every Sunday. Um, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, uh, and in Jesus Christ, his Son, our Lord, who was begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made. Very God, a very God. No, you're not going to find all, all of that language. You're not going to find people talking about there is one God in three persons. Mm -hmm. But if the question is, does the New Testament teach that Yahweh, the God of Israel, is perfectly God, that Jesus is fully God, that the Holy Spirit is fully God, and yet they can still talk about God as one? Yeah, you find that in, in many okay. passages. So that's where the skeptic can come along and sound like they're reporting the truth. Yeah, the, the full-blown 4th century doctrine of the Trinity is not word for word found anywhere in the Bible. But are the building blocks all there? Yeah, mm -hmm. I think they are. Okay. Um, and I already forgot what your other two examples were. Uh, <laughs> well, thank you for that. Um, the other two were the suffering of Messiah and the divinity of Jesus. But Yeah, those, those are clearly there in the New Testament. Um, the way Ehrman says that they weren't a part of original Christianity is to say um, the writers were wrong at that point. Okay. Uh, and they were just inventing things about Jesus that weren't really true. Okay. Thank you. Um, another question is, did Jesus believe he was God, or was that, do you believe that some, or is that a belief that could have been developed among, like, the early church leaders, or was Jesus, did he say, believe he, that he was God? Yeah. Um, I kind of answer that the same way I did uh, the one about the Trinity. Mm -hmm. um, Jesus says he was all different kinds of things, but the one thing you cannot find is a chapter and verse in which uh, I sometimes, if I'm doing this live with a group of people, I'll start walking around and like I'm going up to shake somebody's hand okay. and say, uh, hi, what's your name? I'm God. Um, no, he doesn't, uh, he doesn't call himself God like that. But when you look at all of the titles and figures of speech that he does use, son of man, son of God, Lord, Messiah, Savior, Son of David, all of the I Am sayings in John, I'm mm -hmm. the resurrection and the life, the living water, the bread of life, dot, dot, dot. Um, what else does that add up to? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. It's really good. So, some would say that Gnosticism predates Orthodox Christianity. Gnosticism, the idea that of the secret knowledge that only some had. Is there any evidence that supports that, or is it just speculation? It really is pretty speculative. Um, there was a, a historian a, a generation ago now in the 1980s um, whose name was Ed Yamauchi, Japanese-American, 
who wrote uh, a big book on evidences for pre-Christian Gnosticism and basically said, you can't find it. Okay. Um, you can't find it until you get to second century documents. You can postulate, you can hypothesize that stuff was there earlier, but you can't demonstrate it. Okay, thank you. Um, so going back to the Gospel of Thomas, when was it written? And you say yeah, that's my main question: is when it, was it written? And yeah. is there any heretical teachings in it that would show that it's not aligned with Scripture? Yeah, um, I don't know if you've ever looked at it. You can Google it and find copies online real easily. Okay. Um, it's not a gospel as we think of a story. It's a collection of 114 sayings supposedly made by Jesus. Okay. Um, and sometimes there's a connection between two or three sayings. Sometimes they just seem to be thrown in randomly. Um, I would say that, uh, well, the first question, um, I think a responsible dating would say no earlier than the middle of the second century. Okay. Um, the sayings, maybe about a third of them, sound pretty close to what you can find in the New Testament. Um, maybe almost half of them pretty clearly are Gnostic, so that ideas like um, the flesh is evil, don't look for the resurrection of the body, just look for the immortality of the soul, um, women are inferior to men, mm -hmm. Um, Judaism and the God of the Old Testament is inferior. Um, one of my favorites is uh, Jesus gets asked, uh, is it important to circumcise baby boys? And he says, if God wanted them circumcised, they'd emerge from their mother's womb that way. <laughs> okay. It's like he just blows off the entire uh, history of Old Testament <laughs> ritual. <laughs> Okay. Uh, so uh, what what makes Thomas so intriguing are the the leftover sayings. So maybe about a sixth or or so uh, that you read them and you say, hmm, not sure what this means. Okay. Um, it could be the real Jesus. Um, split the wood chop a log in half, and I am there. Okay. Turn over a rock, and I am there. Mm -hmm. Well, um... <laughs> it sounds a little Eastern. This, yeah, but on the one hand, is that Jesus simply saying, you can't go anywhere in the world, and I won't be with you? Yeah. Or, yeah, it's a little Eastern. You're right. It, mm -hmm. It's hard to know. And so... Those are the kinds of things. There's another one that says, uh, um, he who is near me is near the fire. He who is far from me is far from the kingdom. Okay. Well, what's the fire? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> is it a purifying fire? Is it a burning fire? Is, um, if you're far from Jesus, you're far from the kingdom. I, I can put that in a credible context, but it could also be something really mystical. Yeah. It's just hard to know. Okay. Um, are there any early church scholars or fathers to your knowledge of that cite the Gospel of Thomas, or did they kind of just follow along with Gnosticism? Who, who cited it, you say? Yeah, would, that, like, that would use it as support for a doctrine that they're trying to oh. push. Not, not outside of Gnostic circles. Okay. To speak of, no. Okay. Thank you. Um, so that's my questions for about the historic, historicity of the Gospels and things like that. So moving on, so there's a lot of historical evidence to support Jesus, his resurrection. Just It's really amazing. Um, how would you respond to a statement that says that the secular beliefs in Big Bang, evolution, that they, it provides all the answers, that e and that even if there's a lot of historical evidence for Jesus and his resurrection that it doesn't matter because these things have already been proven. 
So somehow the Big Bang rules out God. Is that the idea? I think it's. I don't. I don't agree with it at all. It's just an argument that I've heard a plethora of times, and it just makes me. I was wondering what I your mean, response when, was. When, when uh, I don't know if you ever saw the movie a few years ago about Stephen Hawking's life, um, and of course now he's passed away a year or so ago, but uh, when he still believed in the Big Bang, people said, "Well, then you shouldn't have any objection." To Christianity, because mm -hmm. who made the Big Bang? Mm -hmm. Definitely, definitely. Um, I mean, did something just come into existence out of nothing? And so it really wasn't until Hawking started his views of multiple universes going backwards indefinitely so that you never even have a beginning uh, that uh, he could say, so there's no need for God. Um, but then you have the whole philosophical question of, is that even a meaningful concept? Mm -hmm. um, we can, we, we learn in, I don't know, grade school, junior high math to add negative numbers. So we can do negative five plus negative 10 and get back to negative 15 and if that's too confusing, we look at a thermometer in the coldest day of the year when it's below zero. Yeah. Time, except as it moves forward. Okay. So, does it does it even make sense to say you can go back in time indefinitely? Okay. I, I can conceptualize it because I've studied math, mm -hmm. but I can only ever experience time moving forward. Okay. So it seems that no matter how far back you go, no matter how many universes you postulate, the, the question still is, how did it start? Yes, yes, definitely. Or, or another way of putting it is, why forget what happened in the past? Why today is there something mm -hmm. rather than nothing? Yeah, definitely, definitely. I think, yeah, that's a really good response. That's something that at least for me has really helped me with the existence of God is that there has to be a first cause to, yeah. to put this war into existence. Yeah. So the, a couple questions, the last few questions I have are about the gospel and what it means today. So my first question is, why did Jesus speak in parables most of the time. Why was that was the most common way of addressing the disciples and others? Well, it was a very common uh, Jewish form of teaching. We have uh, parables that the rabbis uh, spoke and used uh, for a number of centuries uh, from Jesus' time onward. Um, so it was, it was the type of teaching that people were used to. Um, it allowed him to tell stories that uh, grabbed your attention and yet sounded completely harmless. Mm -hmm. um, the, the one example in the Old Testament, I don't know if you're familiar with it, in uh, 2 Samuel when Nathan goes to David after he's killed Uriah, after he's committed adultery with yeah. Bathsheba. I think it's 2 Samuel 12, and he says, King, let me tell you a story about a rich man who was neighbor to a poor man. The rich man had flocks and flocks of sheep. Okay. The poor man just had one little baby female sheep. And you know what the rich man did? He stole that one. It doesn't okay. sound like Nathan's talking about anything about David, and David still has generally good moral instincts, and he starts to get outraged. And he says, that man should die. Okay, yeah, yeah, I remember and then, that. And then Nathan uh, <laughs> takes his own life into his own hands, because David <laughs> could have killed him, but he goes, you're the man. Yeah. You're the one who did that. Bathsheba was the 
the little sheep and Uriah was the, the owner and and then David repents. Okay. Now, hey. what if Nathan had just walked in the courtroom and said, courtroom, the throne room, and said, um, King, can we talk about what you did with Bathsheba and what you did to Uriah? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> the defenses go up. And, yeah. Yeah. Then he might have taken his his life. I don't know. Uh, so yeah, you you tell a story about uh, a guy walking on a dangerous road who's robbed and uh, dying and left by the side of the road, and uh, along come a priest. Oh good Jewish clergyman mm -hmm. finally rescues at hand and shocking he walks by on the other side and then comes a Levite today be the worship pastor and uh, he does the same thing okay and now comes a Samaritan and if this were a melodrama the, the signs would go up and everybody in the crowd is supposed to go boo <laughs> yes. yeah and he turns out to be the hero okay yeah. Now, Mr. Lawyer, you asked me this question, who is my neighbor? In that story, who is the neighbor? And the guy can't even bring himself to say the word Samaritan. He just says, um, the one who showed mercy to him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Oh, go and do likewise. So it, it sucks you into a story that you don't think is about you at all. Mm-hmm until you realize it is and it's too late you can't escape it <laughs> <laughs> thank you that makes you're, you're, that makes a lot change, of sense to change the example you're already halfway to mordor and you can't turn around <laughs> <laughs> thank you. yeah that makes a lot of sense that's a really amazing way of explaining it um another question about jesus is was jesus a pacifist on who you ask. <laughs> yeah. He certainly wasn't a warmonger. Yeah. Um, I, I respect friends that have thought about this a lot and who, who are pacifists and would argue um, that he was. I'm not sure... I'm not sure the Gospels really intended to answer that question. Okay. Uh, yeah, he tells him, put away your sword, but that's because he knows his mission is to die on the cross. Mm -hmm. And I don't think you can generalize from that and say, therefore, there's never uh, a use for the sword. Um, but if there is, I think it would have to be as a last resort very much okay that makes a lot of sense yeah that's a really interesting question to me because there's i have one of my teachers that i've grown close to is actually he believes yeah. he, he, he's a pacifist he doesn't believe it, but at the same time you look at it and how we're supposed to defend the orphans and the widows and people like that it's just there you go very yeah. interesting it's a very there's i can see both sides so it's just very interesting um so another question about how I have Jesus was, how could Jesus be sinless with free will? I mean, I guess it's kind of hard to look through Jesus' eyes and be Jesus because we live in a very different world and have a very di different mindset of Jesus. But was that possible? And if he did, which I believe he did, and I'm sure you do, how did he do it? At least, could you explain a little bit? Well, freedom doesn't mean... You have to choose a certain kind of option. Mm -hmm. um, this is only a partial analogy, but living in Colorado, my wife and I like to go out on short hikes, usually about half day a week. And there have been many, many times when we have walked close enough to the edge of something that I have had the freedom to step off kill myself mm -hmm. I've never done it I don't think I ever will I have no intention of doing it mm -hmm. so just because I have the freedom to do something doesn't mean I inevitably will at some point okay okay thank you um, so my last question for you is in our culture today 
at least I see a very God is love, God loves you how you are, Jesus loves you how you were, if you're gay, if you're a sinner, every sinner, every sin, you can keep doing it. Is that Jesus that we have in today's society, the same Jesus that we see in the Bible? Not quite, no. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know who first said, uh, God loves you so much, he'll meet you exactly where you are, and he loves you so much that he doesn't want to keep you there. Um, so, uh, yeah, there's judgment, um, and Jesus talks about heaven and hell along with a lot of other things that he talks about, and uh, uh, he never suggests that everybody automatically goes to heaven, um, mm -hmm. but he says a lot to suggest that final judgment will be based on how people have responded to him. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so my final question is, how have you and your studies of the New Testament and the Gospels and the parables, how have they affected you and your faith? Have they strengthened it? Have they made... Yeah. Very much so. Um, sure, you, you're always coming across new thoughts. And somebody raises a new challenge, new idea, although... It's, it's so interesting. Uh, there, are, there aren't too many advantages of uh, being in your 60s other than uh, you've seen a lot of life. But uh, I think back to all the questions that uh, my high school friends, my college friends asked me in the 70s. And um, with a few little twists here and there, uh, Names of viewpoints change, new scholars emerge, but it's pretty much the same set of questions. Okay. And uh, so one of the things I try to tell, especially uh, college or high school groups, uh, if you come up with what seems like a brand new problem that you've never thought of before and you're not aware of any good response to it, well, start digging. Okay. Because somebody, somebody has given a good response to it. You just haven't found it. Okay. Yet. Um, the, the, there, there really isn't. Solomon said there's nothing new under the sun, so I guess mm -hmm. I shouldn't dispute that. Um, but uh, you know, the the main challenges are always the same. The clothing people put them in differs a little bit, but okay. There's, there's good answers out there, yeah. Um, I've, I've only had my faith strengthened. Okay. Thank you. Um, I think that's all the questions I have, so thank you very much what for your time. fantastic uh, set of questions you've <laughs> your homework. I was hoping that it'd be good. So yeah. thank you very much for your time, and I really appreciate it. Do, do I ever get a chance to see what you write from all of this? Sure. Um... I'll email you because this is a big project I have yeah. through the weeks. I have essays I'm writing and a bunch of things. So I think my, my project will end in April, but I'll be sure to keep in contact and give, show you what I have. I don't need to see anything before April. I got plenty to do, but uh, I, I just love to see it. I'm so encouraged you're doing this. Okay. Thank you very much. I really appreciate right. your time. Take care. Have a good afternoon. Bye-bye.